Lori Vallow Dayville's sentencing could shock the world. Why, you might ask? Well, Idaho is one of only four states in the country that do not allow a guilty by reason of insanity plea. But does the alternative give an opportunity for Lori to slip through the justice system on a loophole we never saw coming? I know this sounds crazy, but hear me out. The Idaho legislature approved a statute in 1982, which states that a mental condition shall not be a defense to any charge of criminal conduct. Instead, if a defendant is found guilty of a crime, the judge may consider the defendant's mental condition as a mitigating factor in sentencing. Remember the sentencing part of the statement. We'll come back to that. But first, let me explain why this law exists in Idaho. There are a number of reasons, but let's just talk about three real quick. One reason is that the legislature believed that the insanity defense was way too easy to abuse. Defendants could simply claim to be mentally ill in order to avoid punishment for their crimes. We had a second reason. The legislature believed that the insanity defense was unfair to victims. Victims and their families often felt that the insanity defense let criminals off too easily. Third reason, the legislature believed that the insanity defense was not necessary. Defendants who are truly mentally ill can still be held accountable for their actions. They can be sent to a mental health treatment facility where they can receive the treatment they need. The guilty but mentally ill, which is called GBMI verdict, is Idaho's compromise between the insanity defense and the traditional guilty verdict. Under the guilty but mentally ill verdict, a defendant is found guilty of a crime, but the judge also finds that the defendant's mental health condition was a significant factor in the crime. The guilty but mentally ill verdict has been controversial since it was first enacted. But if Lori's defense is able to pull off anything other than life without the possibility of parole for Lori, it may be because of a loophole in this law. Even though Lori Fallow Daybell was convicted of two counts of first degree murder in the deaths of her children and guilty of conspiracy to commit murder in the death of Tammy Daybell, her sentencing might not be as cut and dry as you might think. One little tiny hint that a loophole might be in play was given early on in this case. Since the case has so much complexity, you might have missed it. In order to understand this little hint that I'm talking about, let me give you a quick overview of Lori's claims. Lori apparently believes that she is an exalted goddess and she and Chad are directed to lead the 144,000 people in preparing for the end of the world. Lori and Chad claim that they have extraordinary abilities. Some of these abilities include the power to teleport. Yeah, you didn't hear that wrong, teleport. And they believe they can cause harm to others. They have the ability, according to them, to call up natural disasters. They have the ability to pray away demonic spirits attached to others. And also they claim they have visionary capabilities. Because of these abilities provided to them, they feel they are qualified to tell whether someone has a light or dark scale associated with them. This scale would indicate whether or not they have a demonic spirit. 
There were many people on Lori and Chad's hit list, according to the documents passed between Lori and Chad. On those lists were, who were considered on the dark scale, just to name a few, are Lori's fourth husband, Charles, her children, JJ and Tylee, and Chad's first wife, Tammy Daybell, all of whom ended up dead. The prosecutors and the judge knew all of this and much more long before Lori was committed to a mental institution twice before her trial officially started. She stayed in the facility until she was deemed competent to stand trial. What her exact diagnosis is has never been made public, so I won't even try to speculate. But suffice it to say, even though prosecutors initially disputed Lori being unfit to stand trial, Special Prosecutor Rob Wood withdrew his contest to the court's decision, dropping the objection, which basically means he agreed that Lori should be committed to a mental institution. My question is this, what happened at that time that convinced everyone involved, even the prosecuting team, that Lori needed a mental health facility. Look, we have all that craziness already. So something else must have happened. This is the question of the hour. Will we be privy to find out what it was that happened? I don't know. There has to be so much more to this story than what we the public is currently allowed to see. But the bottom line is, whatever convinced all that were involved in her case that she was not mentally well could be the same evidence to prove that she was not competent when the murders happened. And this will be the very thing that could be in that little loophole that I'm talking about. Let's discuss the possibility of her having mental illness and then why it wasn't used during her trial, if that was actually the case. Now remember, Lori's mental health issues were not ever brought up during her actual trial, but we were given a clue way back in January that the defense planned to argue Lori's mental health issues at the sentencing rather than during the trial makes you wonder what reason would they have for going this route well let's dissect a little bit let's face it the defense cannot litigate against a client's will so basically lori tied her defense team's hands over and over throughout the process these defense attorneys might have figured out a way even with their tied hands to have an ace up their sleeve. Before I explain the possible ace, I want to discuss what ways Lori blocked possible defense strategies in her case throughout the trial. During Lori's trial, she would not allow her defense to argue that she was mentally ill or that her husband Chad made her do it. And she certainly did not ever show any sign that she was sorry. If Lori's attorneys could have argued that she was mentally ill or having an episode during the murders, they then could have called expert witnesses to testify her, about her mental health. They could have then introduced evidence about her history of mental illness, but Lori refused to allow them to do this. It's a tricky business because in other states, the defense could have argued it with or without their client's consent because they could argue she was mentally ill and can't make the decision. But this is very different in the state of Idaho, according to the guilty but mentally ill law. It's just a different, it's different. 
Lori's lawyers, I'm sure, would have loved to argue that her husband, Chad Daybell, was the mastermind behind the murders. That's defense team 101 to go after the spouse. Then they could have introduced evidence that Chad Daybell had a history of violence and that he had a motive to kill her children and his first wife. But Lori refused to allow anything to be said against her husband. In fact, during the closing arguments, Lori's attorney did tip his hand just a little bit and said derogatory things about Chad. And it was obvious that Lori was furious about that. Lori's lawyers, I'm guessing, would have loved for her to show some sort of remorse, even possibly to try to get a deal, explaining that she was sorry for what she had done. But just like every other possible defense strategy that's usually used in cases like this, Lori refused. Lori's decision to block these defense strategies made it more difficult for her lawyers to defend her. I can't even imagine being her lawyers. The jury didn't hear any evidence about her mental health, which could have been used to explain her actions. The jury also did not hear any evidence about Chad Daybell's involvement, really, really not much. And they didn't hear about Lori's own remorse for what she had done. In fact, the opposite happened. She couldn't help herself during the court. She would be seen giggling, laughing, smiling at the most inappropriate times. It's important to note that Lori's decision to block these defense strategies, it's not illegal. She has the right to refuse to allow witnesses to testify, and she has the right to decide what evidence is presented at her trial. But her decision made it more difficult for her lawyers to defend her, and it may have contributed to her conviction. But what if, now just listen, hear me out right here. What if after all this, her defense team is able to convince Judge Boyce during the sentencing statements that Lori really was mentally ill at the time of the crimes? as evidenced by her pre-trial mental health stays. Will she receive a much lower sentence and possibly no prison time whatsoever based on the Idaho law regarding mental illness? If that were to happen, I don't believe that it would be a quick decision on the part of Judge Boyce. He's been privy to so much more behind the scenes than we ever actually know because of all those closed behind doors hearings. Let's face it, there's so much that we don't know about this case. Even though Lori's mental health was never brought up during the trial, the defense has been waiting to play that card during sentencing. It's kind of a smart strategy because there's no cross-examination. It's just comments, right? It's just statements. Remember, way back in January, the defense let it be known that they would be arguing mental health during the trial, but they would save it for the defense arguments during sentencing. Is the defense strategy to hold the one ace that they have until the last play of the game something that will pay off? Will Lori's one and only ace she has in this court case be enough to keep her out of prison? Let me give you just a little bit of the details of what it means to be guilty but mentally ill in the state of Idaho. To be found guilty but mentally ill, the defendant must meet two criteria. First of all, they must be guilty of a crime. Check. Secondly, they, their mental illness must have played a substantial role in their actions. If a defendant is found guilty but mentally ill, GBMI, they will be sentenced, get ready, to a mental health treatment facility instead of prison. Here's the question of the hour. 
If Judge Boyce agrees that Lori was mentally ill during her crimes, will he order Lori to a mental health facility instead of prison? Or will she get both mental health facility, then prison? There are a lot of options. The guilty but mentally ill verdict is not an easy one to obtain. The defendant has to have a clear history of mental illness and their mental illness must have a significant factor in their actions. What do you think? Will Lori end up in a mental health facility instead of the Idaho State Penitentiary for the crimes she has committed? I personally believe in the justice system and I hope that no loophole keeps Judge Boyce from pronouncing a life without parole. But, you know, in the state of Idaho, it's called something different, just so you know. The term that they use in Idaho instead of a life without parole is fixed life sentence. This means that the defendant will be sentenced to life in prison and will not be eligible for parole. So let's hope for those words on Monday's sentencing. That is, this is what we want to hear. Lori Noreen Fallow Daybell, you are now sentenced to a fixed life sentence. That's what we want to hear. Regardless what happens on Monday, Lori will not just get off scotch free because either way, not that she's going to get off scotch free, but no matter what happens, she still has another case pending. And that is conspiracy to commit murder against her husband, Charles, in Arizona. So there's still more court for her to come. But for now, we're on pins and needles waiting for Monday to see what will be Lori's sentence. Oh, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that bell so you'll know when I go live on Monday. See ya.